All right, so we're continuing our series of, in the book of James, and this week we'll be in James chapter 13 through, eight, uh, through 18. Um, last week, we were talking about the vision for mature life when it, when it comes down to our words. Um, oh, the treehouse is dismissed. It looks like you guys are on the way out. Every, chapter 3, verse 13 through 18. Thank you. Good clarification. I've got like five things on my mind at once right now. Can't get them all out at the same time. So um, last week was about um, controlling our words and directing them for good. And James says, this is what maturity looks like. So this week, he asks the question, he says, who is wise and understanding among you? Another way for asking that is, who is mature? Who is wise and understanding among you? Who is mature? The world would tell us, our culture would tell us that the person who is wise is someone who, the most educated, the most successful, the one who's made the most money. We look to those people as, as the ones who we should look up to and model our lives after. But James has a much different answer. He says, in the ESV, he says, by his good conduct... Let him show his works in the meekness, the gentleness of wisdom. By his good conduct, let him show his good works in the meekness of wisdom. The New Living Translation says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Prove it by living an honorable life with good works, with the humility that comes from wisdom. In the message translation, he says, here's what you need to do. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Man, that is so good. There's so many little nuggets in there, but if you summarize it, who is wise and understanding among you is It's wisdom and maturity. Wisdom and maturity are marked by gentleness or meekness rooted in humility. Those are the two words that jump out at me, gentleness and humility. So I want to talk about this. At first, as I'm thinking about this, right off the bat, you know, how would our culture respond to that? If you said, all right, guys, this is what you need to strive for. I need you to to be, you want to be gentle and you want to be humble in the world. And culture, American culture specifically, it's like, oh, sounds kind of passive. That sounds kind of weak. How far is gentleness going to take you in the real world? When everybody's competing for the same thing, how far is that going to take you? Being gentle. How far is humility going to get you in the business world? How far is that going to get you, you know, out in the different areas of things you're striving for? with your kids and sports and with, compet- with grades. Not everybody can be number one. How far is gentleness and humility going to get you when it comes to success? You know, if you look at our, the different movies we like, uh, the, kind of the, the cur- cultural themes, one of them that, that uh, there's all these Viking shows on Netflix, and I think this is like the image the heroes we look up to, this one guy, Uhtred, he takes things by force, which is the opposite of meekness and humility. You know, they show up on a boat, they go into a town, they take everything they want by force and then establish themselves in that community. I think that's an analogy for what success looks like in our culture. And we're told we got to be strong and you got to go after what you want. But James is saying, oh, hold up, hold up. If you want to be wise and understanding, if you want to be truly mature according to the way of Jesus, which is counterculture, it's wisdom and maturity is marked by gentleness rooted in humility. And so what's the truth about that, about gentleness with humility? Gentleness is soft and kind. It is soft and kind. It comes off as soft and kind, but it's not passive and it's definitely not weak. To be a gentle person, to be a humble person, you actually have to be really secure with yourself. You have to have real strength. 
not, not projected strength. You have to know who you are and know what your real power is. Because think about that. It's, it's a risk to live in this dark world as a gentle person. As a humble person, that's a risk. And to take that risk, you really need to be secure. You really need to know your strength. And this comes from humility. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less often. And so I think it's an awareness. Humility is an awareness of who you are, what you're, who you're not, what you're capable of, what you're not capable of, it's having good self-awareness. It's knowing what you have and what you don't have. It's knowing you're understanding your need. And so ultimately, as Christians, that comes from knowing who we are. We're sinners that are saved by grace and called children of God. And, and when we are connected to Christ, we're provided with incredible resources. Paul calls them heavenly resources. And then we, we have a purpose, a greater purpose than we ever have on our own. We're on God's team. We're in God's family. God has a purpose for each one of your lives, and he's going to make sure that purpose is carried out. And so when you start to understand that and under, uh, believe that, all of a sudden you can take the risk of being a gentle person and a humble person in the world because God, God is going to accomplish his will in your life. Isn't that good? If you don't have that, of course you got to posture, you got to fight, you got to have cutthroat competition to get your will done. So we're taking a little bit of a deep dive on that, but that's what James calls out. He said, who is wise among you, understanding among you? Meekness of wisdom, humility, gentleness are the marks of, of true wisdom. But I want to give you a real life example to just really take this point home about gentleness being rooted in wo- and, and um, humility. Think about the difference between Putin, the ruler of Russia. I think they call him the president, but he's a ruler of Russia, and Mr. Rogers. And some of you younger folks, you need to Google Mr. Rogers. You need to watch the movie. You need to watch the, also the documentary. Uh, one of our one of our uh, young folks in our meeting didn't know who Mr. Rogers was. We won't name him. But think about this. Think about Putin. Putin has done a great like public image image uh, campaign. He's always like doing cool manly things. Like he's going hunting. He's got the biggest gun. He gets the biggest game when he goes hunting. He's a boxer. He's got martial arts. He always has his shirt off and he's like flexing for the camera. I'm a tough man. And he's just this always projecting. Think about this like he's winning in these boxing competitions, but the person he's boxing with and training with knows they better lose or you could die. Like they'll really die. And it won't be on the, on, the, on the playing field. If you go against Putin politically, you die. Usually for, it comes in the form of poison or your plane goes down or something, but you die. And so he uses his power and his force to accomplish his will running the country. He takes things by force. He defends his power with force. That is the opposite of James's vision. But then there's Mr. Rogers. Do we all have an image of Mr. Rogers in our head? Do you have his voice? Mr. Rogers is the most gentle human being I've ever seen. And so he wears his little sweater. And I love him. He's so gentle. He's so slow. He comes in on his show and he sits down so calmly. And you just feel the peace oozing off of him. And he just talks to you so calmly and gently and changes shoes to his house shoes. And he and he's and so he and then he the way he interacts with the kids is so disarming. But then when you watch the documentary about Mr. Rogers and the movie, the movie helps, but the documentary really gets the job done. You realize underneath all that gentleness and humility is a powerful man, a fierce warrior when it comes for truth. He has an incredible faith in Christ. He was actually a minister. 
But he did things at, during his time on TV. He was going against the cultural narrative. One, he, he def, in one of his shows, he, he dealt with racism. And things were happening. All the race riots were happening. All this chaos were happening in society. And so gentle Mr. Rogers just made a gentle but incredibly powerful point. On his show, he got a little kiddie pool, and he fills it up with water, and he just takes his shoes off, and he has his, his uh, I can't remember what the role of the black man on the show was, but he, what was he? The mailman comes in. He has him come in, and he invites him to sit down. He says, hey, you want to swim with me? And, and they just go, oh, sure, it's a hot day. And they take their shoes off. They put their feet in the pool together, a black man and a white man. And, and he just does this whole gentle thing. And the message was so powerful because I think the news story of that week was someone threw acid on somebody, for, on a black man for swimming in the pool. And he's like, this is not right. Then they, in the documentary, it just... You need to go watch this thing. But he goes and he, and he had to get public funding for his show. And they had this uh, really intense, mean guy in charge of the hearing. And he goes in there just gently, calm, and powerful, makes his case. And that dude's heart melted, and he gave him the money. This man was a powerful force, but he was so humble. He was so gentle. And he's a great example of true power underneath gentleness. And so we move on. James gives us really a picture and a description of the opposite of maturity, of the opposite of wise, which would be what does it look like to be foolish and immature? And so he describes it in James chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. He says, But if you have bitter jealousy, and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Do not lie. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. That is heavy. So then the message translation, he says, mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's animal cunning, devilish plotting. Whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at everyone each other's throats. That's a great picture of relational disorder and chaos. Relational breakdown that happens in our families, in our friend groups, at work, in church. He says the, the source, so he describes it this way, and I love it. A summary would be it's when you have self-centered, hidden motives. And he names two of them, bitter jealousy, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. The problem isn't having ambition and and going after your goals. The problem when it is self-centered and it's winning at all cost. But those are the two words that jump out of there to describe this immature, foolish life. And so self-centered, hindered motives of bitterness, bitter jealousy, and selfish ambition. So let's break that down a little bit. Bitter jealousy is being mad at someone else's success. Jealousy by itself is just when somebody that you're competing with wins or someone's kid does better than your kid or gets picked and your kid doesn't and you're mad about it. Then it starts moving into bitterness. You're starting to be really, really upset on the injustice of it all. And so that's, that's bitter jealousy. And so it's like, I can't believe their child got picked for varsity. My child is so much better. I can't believe they got recognized. And just being so focused on your child's success rather than everyone else's. Or at work, you know, this happens all the time. I cannot believe that person got the promotion. I've been working my butt off. 
I cannot believe, and not just being a little bit disappointed, but bitter jealousy, being mad about it. You can't shake it. You want to talk to everyone about it because it's just not right. You deserve it. That's when we're getting into bitter jealousy. Or your neighbor gets an upgrade, and you're like, dang, I thought we were in the same social class here, and they just got a major upgrade. Oh, no. And then we make ourselves feel better, and we go, they're having a midlife crisis. I'm sane. They're having a midlife crisis. But bitter jealousy. And then there's selfish ambition, which is forcing your agenda. And this is not, most people are not like advertising that we do this. Most people are not that bold where they're like, yeah, I'm a forceful person. I just get it done. Some people are where they're proud about it because it's their way of getting things done. Most people try to hide their forcefulness, hide the way they force their, their selfish ambition. And I would call that manipulation manipulating a circumstance behind the scenes to get your agenda accomplished. That's selfish ambition. Working for your personal success or valuing your personal success over the team's success. This happens in sports all the time. Somebody wants to be a superstar at the expense of the whole team. They're ball hogs. This happens when they're this big and when they're this big. Selfish ambition. This happens at work where we force and manipulate our agenda to get done over the success of the company. And this is normal now, and it's actually rewarded greatly in our culture. Because why would you work for the company or the benefit of the company? But this is what it looks like. These are some examples. If you've ever traveled with a group of people, maybe just in your family, it's, it's the one or two people, this is where it gets real personal, the one or two people who put their personal comfort over the rest of the family. I want the best bedroom. You know, you, get, you intentionally are beating everyone to the scene, to the rental house, so you can scope out the best situation. Anybody done that? <laughs> You, are, you, you, like, look online, and you, like, read all the descriptions, and then you send the group text, hey, me and so-and-so will be staying in this room. But we put our personal comfort over the community's comfort. And so these are potential examples of what selfish ambition looks like. And here's what's interesting about what James says. He says, when one, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition He calls them earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. His point is, they don't come from God. Those are not fruits of the Holy Spirit in you, growing you in the character of Christ. Those are not fruits of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit is all about unity and peace among people, oneness in the church. Those come from this world that is broken. And there's demonic forces behind the scene trying to create chaos in our lives. Whether it's within your marriage or within your family or, or wherever. Wherever you have relationships. And so then he goes, what's the result? He says the result is wherever you have jealousy and selfish ambition, wherever it exists, there will be disorder and chaos in every vile practice. I like the picture the message gives. It's whenever you try to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at each other's throat. Just look at our relationships. I wonder if selfish ambition and jealousy could be the deeper issue in most of our relational situations, challenging relationships. Where does that Cutthroat competition. Me over everyone else. I wonder if you were to look at your, your most challenging relationships and, and, and just quote James here, does jealousy and selfish ambition exist in this relationship group on any side? And if it does, it's interesting. You know what to do. 
So then he finishes up and he gives us, he, can, he expands his vision of maturity and wisdom with some more descriptors. In verse 17 through 18, he says, but the wisdom from above is first pure or holy, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, open to reason. That one jumped out at me. Another translation says, willing to yield to others. I've been highlighting that all week in my family. As we're around the dinner table and there's little little competitions happening, I said, you know, a mark of, of maturity is being willing to yield to others. That means when you are right or you think you're right or it doesn't matter if you're right, you're willing to drop it. But the responses I've gotten from multiple people is, oh, that doesn't work. But this is what James says, willing to yield to others, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. A harvest of righteousness, being right with God, right living, reflecting the kingdom of God is is the fruit of, of doing the hard work of getting along with others. And I'll read the message. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. It's gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessing. Not hot one day or cold the next. That's the impartial. Not two-faced. You can develop a healthy and robust community, a family, friend group, community at work that lives right with God and enjoys its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. I told you a couple weeks ago in this pastor training I did, they pinned me and the, the leader was like, hey, there's one competitive verse in the whole Bible. And it's in Romans and it's outdo one another. I'm like, I like outdo. Outdo one another in giving honor. And that's what it is, honoring one another. And when you do that, when you respect each other, good fruits in the community are born. That's that's the vision of of wisdom and maturity in relationships. And so just to make a list there of the characteristics he's described as being holy, and the only way we're holy is by hanging out with God, getting along with others, being gentle, reasonable, willing to yield, overflowing with mercy and blessing. I'll tell you, I was, I've been thinking a lot about these qualities, and a lot of these go against my nature. And so I've been thinking about this because I, I really think, we talked last week about taking your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And so I've been paying attention to my thought life. And when I go, I mean, I've got so much practice to, and, and so much opportunity to grow in my sanctification and my holiness and, and become like Jesus, just right in my family, because five of us live in the house together. That's five opportunities, because I'm included in that, to grow. And so what I've noticed is when I come into a situation, where, whether I'm grumpy or someone else is grumpy, and eventually their grumpiness wears down my patience, What flows out of my mouth and my actions that I take, if I am paying attention to my thought life, I realize it's it's either, it's real black and white for me. It's either earthly, unspiritual, and demonic, or it's, it's things that the Holy Spirit would recommend that I think about. And depending where my headspace is in those interaction, there's either I either add to the chaos in disorder or like Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer diffuses anger. I become a peacemaker. But it all begins what's floating around in your head and the state of your spiritual self at that time. Are you leaning? Are you being transformed by the Holy Spirit? Are you paying attention to the things of the Spirit? Or are you just so in the world you become like the world? But it's interesting when you start paying attention to that. So, but Jesus is the perfect example 
of what James is talking about here. These descriptors, getting along with others, being holy, gentle, reasonable, willing to yield the others, overflowing with mercy and blessing. Jesus is our ultimate example here, and there's so many great examples from the gospel stories of, and really, he just, to me, I love, I love looking at stories, looking at profiles of people, and, and then different settings, where, whether it's work or family settings where there's power dynamics. And if you look at things where you see, like, what is the power relationship in these relationships between these people? If you look at the Gospels that way, it's so interesting. Jesus is the most powerful person in the universe. And he humbled himself to live like one of us on this earth. And so what is so incredible when on this side of the cross and with the scripture, we get to look back and see Jesus in action. And so there's a couple stories, but one one is a really powerful story of, of power dynamics where, you know, Peter's way of getting things done versus Jesus's way of getting things done. They're in the garden. Jesus has already told his disciples the game plan. I'm going to the cross. I will be arrested, I will be crucified, I'll be in the grave, and then I'll be raised from the dead, and we will hang out again. But they didn't get the message. And so Peter, in multiple situations, was like, no, 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 that's not the game plan. That, that is a weak game plan. These are not Peter's words, this is my summary. It's like, that's, that's just not going to get the job done. And so what does Peter do? Because they had a conversation about it earlier at dinner, right? But then when they're in the garden and it's about to go down, Judas shows up with with all the people to arrest Jesus. Peter whips out his sword and chops off someone's ear. And Jesus is like, we just talked about this. He fixes the guy's ear. But then what? the, the most powerful person in the world allows himself to be arrested. What humility to be that focused on God's mission in the moment. Not my will, but your will be done, Father. But he has the power, just by the power of his words, he could take care of this problem. But he is willing to yield in that moment for the joy set beyond him. But that's power displayed and presented as gentleness and humility. He didn't hit back. I relate with Peter. There's a problem. I want to get out the sword. Or maybe, maybe you would, you're like, oh, I don't have a sword. I don't, I'm not a violent person. But you just whip out your credit card <laughs> and you take care of the problem. But, but Jesus' way is, is humility and gentleness and all these qualities that James, and there's one other example that I say all the time because I just love it. The interaction between Pilate, who was the most powerful person in that, that area at the time, and Jesus' interaction, I love it. I think it's John 19, verse 11. Jesus just gently reminds him of the truth. He wasn't boasting. He was just setting Pilate straight. You would not have power unless my father above gave it to you. Just know that. Because Paul was like, hey, I can get you out of this. I can get you out of this. I mean, imagine if you had that kind of power and you were in that situation, what would you do? But Jesus displays the ultimate power displayed in humility. It's so beautiful. And so James gives us this description of maturity and wisdom. And so the question that we have to ask as we close this up is, how do we grow in wisdom and maturity? How do we become gentle and be gentle rooted with humility? And so I've been saying this every time we talk about growth is remember maturity is a slow, lifelong process. I love how Paul says that it's one degree of glory at a time. He says, as I, as I behold the face of God, I'm transformed into his image one degree of glory at a time. I love that picture because it's slow. As we walk and follow Jesus, we grow by hanging out with him and practicing his way of life. And guess what? For every mistake along the way, there's grace that meets us. God meets us with his grace when we don't do this, when we're forceful, 
when we get caught up in the moment and we, we just start competing and we're contributing to the chaos, when we, when we let the, 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 what we think is unjust take over and go, I'm going to make it right, when we get too involved in, in making things right for our kids and we come in, it's no longer helicopter parents. I heard a new term. It's Apache parents. It's a helicopter with guns. You touch my kid, you're getting destroyed. It's when we get caught up, there's grace for us in those moments. And so a couple of questions to think about is, the first, none of this matters if you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ by placing your faith, your trust in him? The Bible says, confess and believe. Confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that Christ raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's the starting point. And so many miraculous, invisible things happen when you do that. But that is the foundation of your growth. But self-awareness is important. Are you aware of who you are in Christ and the resources available to you? The resources that come with knowing Christ. There are so many. God is the source of your change. He is the source of, of, and when you start to learn about those resources, we did a whole series on our identity in Christ, so you can go back and look at that. But when you start to learn about those resources and believe them that they're true and live from them, you start to really understand power. You don't have to fake it anymore. You don't have to posture because you know who you are and you're okay with who you're not. You know what you're capable of and you're okay with what you're not capable of. You're, you're, you're thankful for what you have and you're not all worked up by what you don't have because you know that you're right where God has you. That's a good place to be, and it's a great source of true power and humility. So what are some of the qualities of the, that we listed here with wisdom and maturity, gentleness, humility, getting along with others, a holy life, being reasonable and willing to yield to others, overflowing with mercy and blessing? That doesn't happen by accident. Which of these qualities do you need to grow in? Don't overwhelm yourself because I look at that list and I go, all of them, but that's not going to get done today. So I go, what, what really stands out to me that has my, my number? It's been gentleness for the last 10 years, and I can see where I'm growing in gentleness. But what is it for you? Ask God for help in this area. When you start a conversation with God on this, he will show up in your life at the most inconvenient times to remind you about what your goal is. And it's, it's how he works. And finally... Imagine, how would your life be better with these qualities if you possess these qualities? Think about your home. How would your home be better? Think about your relationships at work. If, if you started growing in these qualities in a, in a pretty dramatic way. And it's a risk because you're like, man, I won't make as much money. God's economy is interesting. You may not make enough, the same amount of money, but it's really interesting when God's way produces good results because that's mind-blowing. But you also have to risk it not working out exactly like you planned because his way is better. But, but how would it be better at those different relationships? And, and then the one thing we can't forget is our main purpose is to represent the glory of God. How would this, would, would your life represent the glory of God better doing it your natural way or, or, or growing in James's vision of maturity and wisdom? Which one is going to give God more glory? God has a foolproof plan because even when we screw it up, and I've got a lot of practice in this, when I screw it up, he gives us a way to make it right, and it's worse. you got to go back to those people. It's way, it takes way more humility to go, I messed up. 
it's way better to do it right the first time. But he gives us a way when we mess up to go back and say, you know what? I, I blew that. That's not my standard. I'm trying to be like Jesus. And Jesus is incredibly powerful and gentle. And I wasn't. Will you forgive me? That takes a lot of humility. But Jesus will be glorified either way. So think about that. Pray about that. And put this these qualities into practice because when you combine your prayer and you receive God's power and then you practice it, transformation happens. And you will see yourself grow in maturity. God's plan is for you to mature, so it will happen, especially if you're participating. It's a beautiful vision. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I am so thankful for your word. I'm thankful for the book of James and just the, the faith in action, the practical application of James. It can be applied to our lives in so many ways, but it is definitely challenging when we first look at it. So God, I pray for your help for all of us as we are growing in your character. We're growing in faith, trusting that your way is better than our own way. And just growing in these, these qualities. I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we would, we would see the fruit happening in our lives in just unique and incredible ways. I pray that you would give us constant reminders of what this can look like for us. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.